Nairobi knows two minutes from now um, what happened in the Diocese of Los Angeles yesterday. <coughs> The other piece is that we're less comfortable about our cultural diversity because we know more about it. Uh, we, were talking, we were talking a little while ago about polygamy in Africa. Uh, polygamy is a part of the reality of many cultures in Africa. It is here, too, Utah. Um, and for people who have got some roots in the West, it's quite present. Uh, we made a decision as a nation more than 100 years ago that we were going to make polygamy illegal. Um, contemporaneous polygamy. We have serial polygamy in this country. <laughs> um, but the Anglican Communion 20 odd years ago said to the provinces in Africa, that's your problem. We're not going to get too excited about it. You have to deal with that locally as a pastoral issue. 20 years ago, we might have been able to get away with that in dealing with issues of homosexuality in North America and Western Europe. Today, today it makes people too uncomfortable. The other piece that's involved in that is that people within our own church who were angry about decisions that were being made or even conversations being had about homosexuality have used that as a tool um, to stir up conflict and to seek allies in other parts of the community, which is, if you think about it, rather colonial behavior. Um, the Anglican communion is, I think, in some strife because some parties want to have one understanding of what it means to be an Anglican. That probably doesn't adequately represent what Anglicanism is. If, if you think back to the Elizabethan settlement, uh, when Queen Elizabeth I said, I'm not going to ask you exactly what it is you believe when you go to communion. That's not my job. That's God's job. What I am going to insist on is that you all out there with varying opinions worship at the same table. That's the challenge we have. Um, can we hold that diversity together where we all have to think exactly the same way? How do you think we're doing in the relative health and fragility of the Episcopal Church? I think within the Episcopal Church today, we're doing a whole lot better than we were three or four years ago. Uh, so I think the level of conflict has come down, uh, partly because the people who have, were angriest um, have left, which is sad because their voice is gone. Their voice is gone. And I think because there is a growing awareness across the United States that these issues aren't going to go away. Uh, there is a, the very fact that several states and state legislatures have voted to legalize um, either same-sex marriage or same-sex unions in the last few years um, says that it's an issue in the society that people are coming to a different understanding of. And three and a half years ago, you flew your plane out of the Las Vegas island and out onto the world stage. You, know, you are, as it said, you are the the first woman to head uh, the Episcopal Church because I'm a bishop. You're still the first woman to head in the province of the Anglican Communion. You've been vilified, demonized, or maybe just shunned um, because you're female and because of some of the stances you're taking. Um, so if we can speak for a bit about Catherine and Jennifer Shore in the global community, how are you doing? How is this adventure going on for you? Uh, it is an adventure. Yeah, I think that's a good thing. Uh, I think when the world is too comfortable, we're not, we're not listening well enough to where God is calling us. I've talked to all the clients of the Anglican community, and I don't have deep conversations with all of them. But you know, face to face, most of us find it pretty difficult to be um, overtly rude in <laughs> church. There's a lot of southern. <laughs> in the manners around the Anglican community. <laughs> we may be, you know, 
working overtime here, uh, but face to face, we usually treat each other decently. That's one reason I think those relations, continuing those conversations and relationships is so important. When we see the image of God sitting in front of us, it's a lot harder to dismiss. How do you think being in the position has changed you or, and or altered your uh, priorities for your vision of the church? I think it's deepened my uh, conviction that focusing on the least of these, on the most vulnerable, on the people who are ignored and shunned and pushed out, is who we are meant to be. Um, that when we're not doing that, we're not being faithful. Um, going back to saying that how much I enjoy reading through your addresses and statements, some of the things that struck me is they sort of fall into two categories. Um, there are sermons and addresses that are, are like your your sermon prayer service for Haiti, they're about feeding the hungry, they're about um, eradication of poverty, and taking us up on complacency, and then there's another set, terser statements, more direct, that are um, more directly political. Um, you have urged a year ago a ceasefire in the Israeli Gaza conflict. Uh, you've weighed in on the matter of illegal immigration in this country. You've criticized the pending legislation in Uganda um, that would punish <coughs> activities with death. You have um, spoken out about certain government activities in Sudan, Zimbabwe, Congo, a whole bunch of stuff. You really do have a natural role to play. <laughs> you really do have to quite a bully pulpit. But it's also the case that there are a lot of people who go to church um, to escape politics in some hope of transcending political strife. Um, and members of the Episcopal Church remain divided on a lot of the national and global issues of the church um, has taken one side or the other one. So I'd like to hear what your advice would be to clergy in the congregations of the Episcopal Church um, the people who occupy the pulpits that aren't quite as fully as yours, but who have congregations um, full of people who do think differently about these things. What, um, what the place of politics is in the local church? The roots of that word politics come from the word for city, polis. My understanding of politics is that it's the art of living together in the city, in the community. Jesus himself was a political animal. He was always talking about how we're meant to live together. The church cannot be divorced from that conversation. It's, it's absolutely integral to who we are as a community. That said, our job isn't to advocate partisan politics. It's to look for the, the gospel values uh, that lie behind what leads to healthy and holy community. And there can be disagreement about that. Um, abortion is probably a, a remarkable example of that. You know, the Episcopal Church has said over and over and over again that abortion is a moral tragedy but it needs to be legal. The church has said over and over and over again that we are against the death penalty. There are Episcopalians who disagree with both of those. That's an example of what it means to hold together in one community people with varying opinions. We don't chuck you out if you disagree with the church's teaching on those things, unlike some other communities. We think it's important to have uh, vigorous conversation because we believe that we discover more of the truth of God in those hard conversations. Um, to bring the question of politics into this specific setting, Thomas Jefferson, is that your name? <laughs> <laughs> what is that required? <laughs>